G'day guys, uh, my name is Jared and uh, I am a passionate underwater hobbyist photographer and uh, a bit over a year ago I made a video about using the Olympus TG5 or getting started using the Olympus TG5 underwater and um, a bunch of people asked questions, gave comments, sent me messages um, wanting to learn a little bit more and providing feedback which was awesome, thank you so much guys. And I thought what I'd do in this video a year later um, is do a bit of a follow up and share some of the images that I'm most proud of that have been taken using the Olympus CG5 in different configurations. So um, the purpose of that is if you see something that you like, uh, something that you'd like to be able to replicate, hopefully you'll learn something from this video and be able to apply that to your own underwater photography. Um, so that's the point of, of this little spiel. Um, I do want to preface by saying I'm not a professional, I'm just an ocean nerd with a camera. Um, this configuration that you see here um, is by examples. For example, um, the reason it's set up like this is it is the last configuration that I used to them, which was in Malta um, photographing really big shipwrecks and people. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, why this is set up this way when I show you some of those images a little bit later on. Um, the other thing that I want to share at this stage, and I'll talk about it later on, um, is that I absolutely edit uh, some of my underwater photographs and uh, I don't add or remove objects, I don't add colour that isn't already there, um, but I certainly uh, play with things like exposure, um, so to lighten or darken an image, um, I absolutely crop images so the subject fills more of the frame, um, and I also use a bit of vignetting as well, so that's darkening the edges of the image. Um, to create drama in the photograph or to draw the viewer's attention to, to the subject. So if you're eagle-eyed, you'll notice that some of these have been edited. Um, and that's done because when non-divers, and even divers for that matter, but particularly non-divers, look at these images, I want them to be really, really engaged in the beauty, the complexity, um, and the magic of the underwater world. It's one way that I can communicate my passion and enthusiasm um, for our oceans uh, is, is through the photographs that I take. So that's one of the reasons why I edit, is I want them to be super, super eye-catching, super, super engaging, uh, so it draws people's interest in. Um, so without waffling on anymore, as if you've watched my past videos, you'll know I'm prone to doing, um, let's hook into looking at some images. those images uh, as much as I do. So that's a series of five photographs that I took uh, in 2019, of course we couldn't do a whole lot of travel in 2020, uh, at a place called Darwin, that's in the southern Philippines. Um, and it's a really special part of the world, it's marine reserve, it's a muck diving site, so that means you're spending a lot of time face down in the mud uh, looking for little critters and uh, those images were actually all taken on a single night dive at a site called Dacomi Pier. Um, and I think my first tip for capturing images like that um, is don't be afraid to ask your guide um, to point out the stuff that you want to photograph. Um, I had a guide on that particular trip uh, affectionately known as Bad Touch Tommy um, and he was a local, he'd been diving there for a very long time, had this uncanny ability um, to find what it was you were looking for. And on this particular dive, I said, hey, look, I'd really like to catch a photograph of a bobtail squid. Um, I really wanted to photograph a cronoid crab. So that's that bright orange crab uh, at the beginning of um, the series of images. Uh, and there are a few other bits and pieces that I wanted to capture on that dive as well. So if you can tell your guide what it is you're looking for, um, especially if you've got a good rapport with them, then you'll find that uh, certainly in my experience, they're really helpful in helping you capture those pictures. So, um, what settings did I use? How did I capture those pictures? Actually, it's the most rudimentary setup you can have using the Olympus CG5. It was this thing inside of the housing with just the flat port, so no special lenses, nothing like that, and I was using a handheld torch. 
Um, there's a few reasons for doing it like that. The first is you're photographing things that are teeny tiny um, and you've got to be able to get your camera very close to them, you know, a matter of centimetres. Um, and the other thing is that these big strobe lights are prone to spooking um, shy creatures. I mean, they're prone to spooking just about anything. They're quite obnoxious. Um, but especially at night time, you've got to bear in mind that a lot of these critters have quite sensitive eyes. Um, and setting off honking great big uh, strobe lights isn't very good um, for the animal. And actually, it's not very good for your image as well. So I was using a handheld, to handheld torch. Um, I was very close to the subjects. I had nothing but the camera and the housing. It was set to macro mode. Uh, I was using a relatively high ISO uh, of about 400, um, and that will slow down your shutter speed. But bear in mind, these critters aren't going anywhere quickly. And so if you've got very good buoyancy, um, you're able to be patient, hang tight, wait until you get your photograph, um, take as many as you need. And that's actually another big advantage of constant lights, so torch. Um, is that you don't have to wait for the flash to recycle before you can go ahead and take another picture. So you can take a series of images quite quickly. Hopefully one of them will be a keeper. Um, I've had to put my glasses on because staring at the computer screen is a little bit challenging, I'm afraid. Uh, so a bit of a costume change. But um, the next thing I want to talk about is capturing wider angle images. So looking at um, either a bigger area or a bigger object and, and uh, some of the photographs that I'm really pleased with that I've taken. So um, the next set of images I'm going to show you uh, were taken in three different locations. Um, the first was or is Apo Island. That's also in the southern Philippines. It's a short boat ride. Uh, from Darwin. Um, it's absolutely glorious. Um, it is by far and away the healthiest reef system um, I have ever seen. And if you ever get the chance to go, when you can go, I highly recommend it because it's absolutely glorious. Um, so that was one really, really special dive. Um, we actually, towards the end of that trip, um, took out um, some scooters and decided we were going to try and circumnavigate this island, about three and a half uh, kilometre dive. Um, and it was just absolutely beautiful um, and we got the opportunity to take some some pretty glorious photographs so um, the next set of images that you're going to see um, uh, there's, there's two different kinds and the first is a blue water photograph and I'll talk about that first so a blue water photograph is when you are shooting through lots and lots of water um, often at quite a large object and I absolutely love uh, taking silhouette photographs and I absolutely love capturing sun balls and the TG5 does that quite well. Um, you are going to need to make some additions to your kit and what I've used for these pictures is this thing. It's called an air lens and this is sort of the least expensive accessory lens that you can get for the TG5 setup and all this thing does is replaces the field of view that the camera loses once you take it underwater. So you go from having, having a narrower field of view to a slightly wider field of view. It doesn't give a fisheye effect, which is quite helpful um, in these circumstances because that can create vignetting, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, you are gonna need to make some changes to your equipment. Um, and the first thing you're gonna do is want to set this thing um, to aperture priority mode. And that's because you need to dial a blue. Um, and what that means is you're going to use a low ISO, the lowest you possibly can, because you need um, a fast shutter speed for anything that's moving quickly through the water, otherwise you're gonna get a blurry image. Uh, and then you want to dial down the exposure compensation. So what you're doing is you're telling the camera that you want it to capture less light. And the reason that you're doing that is because it's going to make the blues uh, and the blue of the ocean bluer. So it's going to look uh, to the viewer more like it does to us as divers or as you should expect the ocean um, to look like. Um, when you are shooting into the sun, a sun ball, you want your object to be sort of halfway between uh, you and it and that's going to create the beautiful silhouette effect uh, which you can see 
with the two images that were taken in Fiji. Um, so that's the one of the shark, that solitary shark, um, as it was heading towards uh, an area where they were feeding. And that was a really exciting dive. It's a story for another time because uh, there were a lot of sharks uh, out for breakfast that day. And it was uh, me and a couple of local boys in the water. And boy, we were asking for trouble. And uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't find it because sharks are big old teddy bears most of the time. Um, but nevertheless, that was an image that I, I'm really pleased with because I think it's quite dramatic. Um, and the other one is uh, shooting at that absolutely gorgeous crown jellyfish, um, which are, are very large. Um, so you need to be close enough to them that your strobe is effective. Uh, now, in that particular instance, um, I was okay using a strobe to light the bottom of the jellyfish because it drew out a little bit of detail um, and I needed to be close enough to capture that detail, um, but also without washing the image out with the uh, with the sunlight coming from the sun ball. So in those two circumstances, you're looking for the sun, putting it wherever in the frame you want that, taking your photographs, um, and if you know you're not going to disturb the subject, in the case of a jellyfish, I'm okay with using an artificial light source, um, getting close enough to be able to light it, but also making sure that you keep that uh, sun ball in frame. So, moral of the story, you are going to need an ear lens to achieve that, um, and you are going to need to dial down your exposure compensation um, to get those rich blues, otherwise you're going to get a kind of greeny grey shot that you'll be disappointed with. Um, the other photographs in this series, um, one, so the manta ray that was taken in the Maldives um, quite a while ago, actually, um, and I was not a particularly experienced photographer at that time. So you'll notice that I've feathered that image and I've sharpened it, um, and that's just to make it usable. Um, the other issue was is that I was actually too close to the subject, and that's when you get into the realms of needing a fisheye lens. If you are photographing something that's very large and it's very close to you, you're not going to be able to get that whole animal on the frame and it's going to frustrate you. Um, so in that instance, what I should have done is actually moved away from the area the manta rays were um, and just been patient and waited for them to come close enough to me to get a picture um, that I was pleased with. Um, another one is that photograph of the I have a love-hate relationship with lionfish because I think they're absolutely beautiful to photograph. I think they're fabulous subjects. Um, they're super colourful, um, but they're also super destructive. Um, so the environmentalist in me finds them pretty frustrating because they can be quite destructive to uh, ecosystems, but they're glorious to take pictures of. Um, and in that case, I am using both strobes on a relatively low power setting because I'm quite close to the subject, um, but that allows me to draw all of the colour out of that reef and make use of the natural light from above. So let's have a look at some of those pictures now and then we'll move on to ultra wide angle and taking pictures of people. Coming to the end of uh, what has turned out to be quite a long lecture, so if you've stuck with me this far, thank you very much. Um, and if you're skipping to this part to catch up on uh, shooting wide angle, ultra wide angle on uh, the Olympus TG5, welcome. Um, so this is the mode of photography that I'm newest to. Um, I've really only been shooting wide angle for a year or so uh, across just a couple of dive trips. So um, I am still learning and certainly uh, with wide angle or fisheye underwater photography, you get a whole other set of challenges. Um, the first one is uh, your equipment configuration. What are you gonna need to achieve that? The first thing and, and going back uh, to the configuration I've got in front of me uh, because it was the one that I used most recently um, is you are going to need a, a wide angle or a fisheye lens, which is what this thing here is. It has a 160 degree field of view, so you can capture an awful lot um, of subject 
in your frame um, and you can be very close to it to capture that. You'll see that with some of the shipwrecks, um, particularly the large prop which is on the stern of the MV Carwella, which is a shipwreck in Malta. Um, I was very close to that prop, it's several metres in diameter and you're able to get um, that whole object in the frame. So you are going to need a fisheye lens. Um, the other thing is that when you are lighting a very large subject you need lots of light, particularly when they're at depth. Um, so in that instance a couple of strobes um, and you're going to need them on these arms as well and the reason that you need that is because you want the light sources to be about as far away from the subject as uh, the lens of your camera. So if you're shooting something very very large um, you need this light source to be very very wide so it's filling in a large area. So these arms become absolutely essential so too to powerful strobes. Unfortunately um, when you are shooting uh, ultra wide angle torches aren't going to do it um, and that's because they simply don't have the power to pass through uh, the amount of water you'll be taking your images on um, and they will wash out and they won't be very effective. Um, the other issue that you run into um, is getting the TG5 to capture enough light while uh, operating at a high shutter speed to freeze your subject in frame, which is why I like photographing things like shipwrecks because they don't move. Um, and if your buoyancy is good, you're away laughing. Um, just a quick note on when you are taking photographs um, at depth and of large objects, particularly shipwrecks, um, and it's just a safety note, is just be very mindful of your limitations, um, be mindful of your gas consumption, and make sure you're paying attention to what's going on. Um, I It wasn't a close call, um, but it was certainly a reminder that I need to uh, manage my safety and my gas first, and worry about my photograph second, and that's that when I was on the stern of the Carwella, taking those photographs, it's a bit over 40 metres deep, um, I developed a slow leak uh, in my low pressure hose um, and I, any other time I would have been paying attention to it, I would have noticed it, um, but I was too busy trying to get that photograph and uh, you know, before I knew it I'd lost 50 or 60 bar um, and had to end that dive pretty quickly, safely, uh, albeit, um, but just bear in mind particularly we're at depth and we're using air, which of course can become narcotic. Um, make sure that you're paying more attention to your safety than you are your camera, because you know, these things are a very, very, very easy way to get into trouble very quickly. So, light source, powerful light source, wide angle lens, you wanna be close enough to your subject to touch it. Light source should be as far away from the subject as you are. This guy here, it's gonna be on a high ISO, uh, make sure you're shooting in RAW because you are going to get a grainy image whether you like it or not. So if you're shooting in RAW, uh, you can sharpen that image in post, you can draw some of that blue out and you can edit it without causing too much damage to the file which means you're still going to get a lovely photograph. So I'll share some images um, that I'm quite pleased with, albeit I've still got quite a long way to go in terms of my learning. Um, and the last thing on people, I hate photographing people. Um, most of all because I'm not very good at it. Um, you've really got to coordinate with the person you want to photograph before you get in the water. Um, I'd strongly encourage you to have that conversation and say, hey look, let's try and get some photographs of each other um, or you photograph of your subject before you're underwater. Let them know that you're going to try and take that picture. You are going to blind them with these things, especially if they're on full bore, um, which you might find they have to be. Um, and you really want your subject to be floating mid-water, not touching the reef or any other object underwater. Have them nice and still, get nice and close, move these strobes a long way away so the light's washing the subject, painting the subject, uh, rather than... Uh, than shocking them and blinding them because that can absolutely happen. Um, but besides that, if you've stuck with me for this full 20 minutes, thank you very much. I hope you've learned something. If you've got specific questions, drop them in the comments. Um, I'm not a YouTuber, I don't really aspire to be, but that seems to be the way people share information through this channel. Um, and I'd be glad to help. Um, thanks so much. I'm Jared. Safe diving and happy shooting. All the best, guys. Ciao.